Global markets were volatile again overnight, with slightly stronger than expected US retail sales unleashing a bounce in US Treasury yields. That's coming up in five things in five minutes. And then in our bonus deep dive interview, ANZ senior strategist in China, Zhao Pangxing, takes us inside the rise of the renminbi. This is not the end because uh, renminbi can gain more market share in the future. But first in 5 and 5 with ANZ, global markets were volatile again overnight after slightly better than expected US retail sales data unnerved those who had bet the previous day after soft inflation data that the Fed was finished with rate hikes. The US 10-year Treasury yield rose 11 basis points to 4.55%. The S&P 500 wobbled around its previous close by 5 a.m. Australian time. However, the Aussie was at 65.14 US cents at 5 o'clock, while the Kiwi was at 60.25 US cents. They're both still up more than half a cent from their levels before Tuesday night's inflation data. Gold was flat at $1,965 US 15 an ounce, and West Texas Intermediate Oil was down 1% at $77.33 US a barrel. Number two, ANZ's head of G3 Economics, Brian Martin, says the headline number for US retail sales, a fall of 0.1%, was better than the 0.3% fall expected by the market. Brian looks closely at the control group figure for retail sales. That was up 0.2%. The previous month was also revised up to growth of 0.7%. So when you just look at the sort of two-month momentum, uh, they're still very strong. What we will be having to look at to see is, do these numbers now come down sustainably in the fourth quarter of this year and going into next year? Because that's really what's important, engaging whether or not domestic demand is softening in response to the large hikes in interest rates we've had in the United States since March 2022. Number three, with the market still reaching for certainty about the Fed's next move, Brian says the key thing to follow is the Fed speak. So that's what officials in the Fed's FOMC policymaking committee say in speeches and appearances in the coming days. What are the FOMC speakers saying? There is nothing priced in for a rate rise in December. There's nothing priced in for a rate rise in January. Financial conditions have eased materially in the economy as bond yields have fallen, the dollar has weakened, and equities have rallied. So is the Fed going to push back against that? Is it going to be concerned that these easier financial conditions mean that the efficacy of their monetary tightening isn't as great as it was a couple of months ago? And therefore, will they be concerned that the improvements they're seeing in the labour market and inflation might not be sustainable? So I think Fed speak is going to remain cautious. It's going to try and push back against the market getting ahead of itself. Number four, Australian wage inflation of 1.3% in the September quarter was the highest seen since the starter started in 1997, thanks to some big awards and employment deals. However, as ANZ Australia senior economist Catherine Birch explains, this was in line with expectations and is likely to be the peak in quarterly wage inflation. So it's unlikely to change the RBA's view on the cash rate. But once we get to mid-2024, we do think that we'll start to see annual wage growth ease again. Uh, While the labour market is still very tight, uh, it is starting to ease on a number of indicators. Uh, And also inflation has come down significantly compared with the the peak late last year. Um, And inflation, that higher inflation has been uh, affecting these wage outcomes as well. So that would give the RBA some comfort that while wage growth is pretty strong at the moment, it's probably not going to get too much higher and should start to come down uh, next year. Number five, we got some fresh monthly inflation data in New Zealand. It was weaker than expected in October, which ANZ economist Henry Russell says makes a rate hike in February less likely. It looks less likely that domestic inflation will be the smoking gun for a hike to be delivered as soon as February. But we continue to believe that non-tradable inflation is not going to dissipate as quickly as the Reserve Bank is forecasting in the medium term. But the recent starting point surprises on inflation and a cooler labour market than they'd previously anticipated does make it more plausible that an OCR of 5.5% could be enough to, to do the job for them. 
Henry Russell there. Now it's time for our bonus deep dive interview, where we look at the rise of the renminbi, which had the biggest share of cross-border payments with China's banks in the first nine months of the year for the first time. Here's ANZ senior Asia strategist Xiao Pangxing. Renminbi has become the largest currency uh, in China's cross-border payments. Uh, it also has replaced the, the euro uh, to become the second largest uh, currency uh, in the global trade uh, financing market. Uh, you know, this is a 10 trillion uh, US dollar uh, market uh, in the world. So the big progress I think uh, has made by the renminbi is quite significant. As of the, uh, the end of September, uh, renminbi uh, uh, share in uh, SWIFT global payments uh, has jumped to uh, 3.71%. This is almost the double from uh, the start of last year. This is not the end because uh, Renbi can gain more market share in the future. So what's driving this change? I think uh, in, in, in the global market, uh, Renbi is still a um, small part of the whole economy, but uh, the share of RMB is definitely uh, rising. The biggest driver behind the, the, this rise, I think, is the RMB uh, debt financing, yeah, because uh, you know uh, it's very hard to borrow in uh, in terms of US dollar uh, at this moment, and uh, it's much cheaper to borrow RMB uh, from Chinese banks. Uh, last year, Chinese banks uh, has offered almost uh, almost the 1.2 uh, trillion uh, yuan uh, loans to overseas clients. That means at least the 1 trillion yuan uh, was brought from China to the rest of the world. I think this uh, this is a very big change because of the US dollar funding cost. And also there are some other structural reasons behind the rise of uh, RMB. Uh, one important reason is the geopolitical risk. Uh, you know, the SWIFT was made by the U.S. as a weapon against the Russia. So uh, uh, I think uh, globally uh, there is a uh, going away from the U.S. dollar because of the uh, safety concern. And also uh, the RMB stability is a big contributor to the use of RMB in the global context. Uh, last year, uh, RMB index, uh, the weighted average uh, RMB index against uh, a basket of currency uh, was about uh, 100. And this year, it's still at 100. I think the, the volatility of RMB is much uh, lower than other currencies. So this is a big uh, attribute, good attribute to uh, RMB. Could you tell us about the similarities between the rise of the yen with Japan's economy in the 70s and 80s and the rise of the renminbi with China's economy? Mm, I would say uh, there are uh, a lot of similarity yeah, between uh, renminbi internationalization and uh, yin, uh, yin uh, internationalization 30 years ago. Uh, but uh, there are also some uh, uh, difference. Uh, I think uh, similarity is that uh, China is similar to Japan. Uh, because uh, the economy of uh, Japan is very high leveraged. Also, seem to uh, I think China is also have the leverage uh, problem. So the slowdown of China economy make Chinese exporters would like to uh, send the RMB uh, over to overseas. Uh, this is uh, quite similar to what happened 30 years ago to Japan. ANZ's job punching me. I'm Bernard Hickey. That was five and five with ANZ for Thursday, November the 16th. Catch you tomorrow with all the detail from Australia's jobs report for October, due later today. Podcast contains general information only, not investment advice. You should obtain advice for your personal circumstances before making any investment decisions. Please view the podcast disclaimer available via your media player or email.